growing we should start some announcements now, presumably you know that homework 2 is due today um i hope you've started um i hope if you haven't started uh, as always uh, do it after class um this one talking about uh, linear models and uh, feature transformations and mistake bounds and you'll be you're implementing perceptron i noticed there was a lot of discussion on piazza about uh, the feature transformation and there's actually a very very relevant suggestion uh, i think this uh, this shows up in one of the discussions and uh, there's a very relevant suggestion that almost gives you the answer uh, so i encourage you to take a look at that discussion and try to read between the lines um, um, and uh, the, you know the, the first project milestone also due next tuesday uh, this is the season of deadlines so uh, there's a first project uh, the milestone is supposed to be very easy. Uh, if you've not done it, you know, just spend 15 minutes downloading a file and uploading it, uh, uploading a different file. And uh, any questions about the homework? This is not 145 people, right? Okay. Yeah, any questions about homework? What homework? Projects. Any questions about the project? Yeah, I have. Yes. <laughs> so I see the easy in the right in the yes. Yes. What's the question? Uh, are there any other easy values in other future set? I don't discover yet. Because, uh, all the data that you have is what you have. <laughs> so you know, this is one of those good situations where. Uh, you are you have the features for the evaluation data as well, so that's pretty much all I can say. <laughs> I mean, it's not because I don't. I, I it's not because I'm trying to hide the information. It's just that I don't know. You, you, you there may be missing values in other, uh, but you're never uploading your classifier. You're only uploading predictions. So your code can, every, all the data is available locally to you. So your code should be able to handle it. Um, that's the kind of Curious. <laughs> yeah, you have to you you really have to look at write some scripts to process the data. Okay. Yeah. Also, I will ask your question the other uh, the, the, the the first milestone of the project we get uh, the score zero point one. Is it the accuracy you want? Uh, I can't tell you, but it is the it's not it's not the accuracy. What it's not what accuracy do I want? It's the score that uh, Kaggle returns. Whatever it gives is the answer. Okay, just the uh, return value. Right? Yeah. A uh, couple of questions on Zoom. Can we have solutions of the homeworks or sample questions before the midterm? Uh, did we not post the solutions for homework one? Okay, we'll be posting solutions for homework one shortly. Homework two solutions will be posted uh, after everyone submitted, you know, with the uh, late uh, period and all that. And uh, um, and yeah, uh, and there will be like a sample uh, uh, questions that I'll talk about uh, briefly. Um, and then there's another question is project milestone one that's due uh feb 20th it's just the project uh, uh information i think uh, uh canvas has all the project deadlines in it uh, i don't remember if i called the second thing the milestone one that's kind of if i did that uh, that's very sneaky um we, it's just the project information what's due on feb 20th is just information What's your Kaggle ID and what score does Kaggle return when you upload the dummy submission? Um, I encourage you to read the project document, the README file, the PDF, uh, because uh, it tells a long story, um, but also because uh, it's, it lays down the rules for how the project is played. Uh, in the, we've given you four feature sets and we've given you um, uh, yeah, we've given you four feature sets and the rules are you need to have at the end of the semester, aside from the dummy submission that's due uh, on the 20th, you need to have at least six submissions on Kaggle using at least two of the features, at least four different algorithms and no more than one algorithm that is an external library. Um, if I say it that way, it seems very complicated, but if you think about it, it's not too hard. 
And in particular, the good news is all the work that you're doing for your homeworks in the experiment section, um, if you feel like you want to revisit decision trees, this is your chance. You can you can use it for your project. If you feel like you want to revisit Perceptron, you can use your code for Perceptron for the project. So uh, the same, uh, out of those six submissions, the same rules as the homeworks apply for five of them, it should all be your code. So since you're anyway implementing a whole bunch of learning algorithms, and as the semester goes, you'll be implementing some port vector machines, you'll be implementing some sort of ensembles, you'll be implementing uh, logistic regression, uh, possibly many ensembles. And between all of these, you'll have a, a whole bunch of implementations of algorithms that you can use for your project. Um, so uh, what was, where was I going? So anyway, read the, read the, uh, uh, the documentation um, and plan it out. We've set up the milestone so that you're doing little bits of work for the project through the semester so that it doesn't pile up at the end. Um, so, uh, you know, it, 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 and it also gives you an opportunity to revisit the algorithms and ideas that we encounter in the class. Yes. PyTorch or TensorFlow or Scikit-learn or a machine learning library that you did not implement. Not. Sorry? Not like, not like Pandas, but actual machine learning library. Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah, I read the description of the project. Right? No, right? You said that we at least use two feature sets. Uh, that, uh, is, it, is it okay for me to use only one feature set or only one submission? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. First of the six submissions, you should have touched at least two feature sets. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, usually what happens is with this uh, with, with the class project, people go, some people tend to go a little over exactly about the project with all these features they in combine the features they invent new features they do sorts of feature transformations pre-processing pre just to see if they can get something you know there's a leaderboard that you are you can kind of see where you're uh, uh, you come up with an idea you try it out and you submit it and it changes something yeah another question is about the precision issue i i found that uh, 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 I look at one of the feature set files and uh, it has uh, like a zero, many, many decimal numbers. Yes. And there are, I noticed there are seven ton decimal places, but when I use pandas or non it's it, These things don't matter. The, the If it cuts off somewhere, it's probably not going to matter. Okay. Don't worry. It, okay, we can make assumptions to say I, I, I cut out something. Yeah, yeah. One of the interesting things that's been happening in machine learning lately is uh, uh, there's a lot of push towards what are called low precision models, where uh, you know how uh, real numbers are represented with as floating points mm -hmm. in our code, right? As floats. Mm -hmm. And floats, typically, if you don't say anything, it can be 64 bits mm -hmm. uh, to represent a number. Someone, at some point, someone will say, why do I need 64 bits? Can I, what, what happens if I invent a floating point number that uses only 32 bits. Turns out the accuracy didn't change much. Okay, 16 bits. Turns out it didn't change much still. Okay, 8 bits. We are currently at the 8 bit, uh, in the 8 bit era, where people are, some people are exploring even 4 bits and 2 bit floating point numbers. Mm -hmm. So if you think of 4 bits, that's literally 16 different numbers. And yet, certain models are robust to that change. So precision uh, is, if for some reason, machine learning seems to, uh, a lot of learning applications can are uh, are okay with very low precision. Uh, there are a few questions on Zoom. Are trained dev and test sets used in real life models as well? It's almost like a, a standard sort of um, workflow. Anytime you have a task, you need to set up an evaluation set. Let's call it the test set. The test set is the data that you're going to, uh, it's, it's the exam for your models. So of course, you're not going to be looking at it. And then there's a development set that's used for hyperparameter selection. Rather than doing cross-validation uh, all the time, you can use development set uh, to decide, how, for example, when should the number of epochs in such things. So this sort of split of data into train, dev, and test is a very standard practice for uh, experimental machine learning. Um, now the question, will we go over scikit-learn uh, since one of the submissions uh, we'll have to use a machine learning library. I have no experience with it. Uh, two points. The first one is you don't have to use an external library for the sixth submission. 
you can use at most, you can do at most one submission with an external library. Yeah, I've had uh, cases where students have all six submissions with code that they write on their own. The second point is we may or may not go have the time to go over any specific library. Maybe if time permits, uh, we can do like a, a off cycle uh, session for whoever is interested, maybe run by the TAs that does like a tutorial of maybe Torch or Scikit-learn or something. But uh, even any of those things are going to be, um, shall we say, very disappointing for you because these libraries are so massive that it's not going to be, we can't do justice introducing them in just one session. If you want to use, uh, 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 if you want to use these libraries, you know, the best place to start is the documentation. And, you know, you're, you're not required to use it for the class project. But I would encourage over the course of the semester, look as we encounter these concepts, look at the libraries, because basically when we when we talk about, say, decision trees, you might want, you might be interested in thinking about what kinds of interfaces does scikit-learn offer for decision trees? Because maybe you want to use that when for your uh, next multi-billion dollar startup. Who knows? Um, another question. Okay, it's resolved on Zoom. Okay, other questions? Okay, other announcements. Um, uh, homework one uh, uh, has been graded. I hope uh, you've noticed that uh, the grades are available uh, on Canvas. If you have any questions about it, if, or if you have regrade requests, uh, get in touch with the TA who graded the uh, homework. Um, I We've been somewhat lenient on the grading with this homework uh, because it's the first one. We didn't want to take away points for uh, things that are kind of not directly related to machine learning. Um, for the second homework, we'll be a little bit more uh, stringent about uh, your code running on uh, on CAD and such things. Uh, and uh, there, since um, I generally hear that you all like homeworks a lot, and homework two is due today, uh, I don't want to keep you waiting. Homework three will be available soon. Um, Homework three is going to be different from homeworks one and two. It will look more like homework zero in that it's going to be entirely on canvas. It will be multiple choice questions. Um, some of those multiple choice questions, you know, the, the, the your midterm exam might have those types of questions. But the more important point here is uh, homework three will cover the entire everything that we've covered in the semester so far. And in the process of going through it, hopefully it will help you prepare for your midterm. Uh, it's going to be available on Canvas maybe maybe tomorrow, maybe uh, something like that. Uh, it's not clear about it. But very soon, and you'll get uh, about 10 days for it. Did you have a question, Virat? Uh, I didn't understand what you said, but if I answered it, I, I'm glad. You asked the question. Okay, I answered the question. Okay, uh, of course I did, right? I, I knew you were going to ask that. I still don't know what you were asked, but uh, okay. Um, any, oh, there's a question on, uh, matplotlib did not work on Zoom. Uh, okay, that, that's a uh, detail that maybe uh, one of the TAs can handle. Yeah. Um, and then since we are talking about midterm, there's a midterm uh, in class on the 29th of February. This is a leap year. Um, this midterm comes only once in four years. Um, it will cover everything that we will do in uh, we, we would have done in class till the 22nd of February. That is exactly one week from now, so next Thursday. Um, the exam is going to be self-contained. What that means is it will be closed book, closed notes, closed laptop, closed phone, watch, whatever. So, uh, you know, no, you, you will not need things like calculators and such things. Um, there was a question about uh, can we use a cheat sheet because I don't want to memorize formulas. I don't like memorizing formulas too. So. I'm, I'm not. I'm going to try to make it so that you don't have to remember, rely too much on memorizing big expressions because that's not fun. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I like to say that this is a machine learning class. The goal of machine learning is not to test memorization but generalization, and that will be the philosophy for the exam as well. Um, there will be some sort of a study guide type thing that uh, will be posted um, sometime sometime before the next lecture. It's going to look like a whole bunch of questions that will not show up in the middle. Mm -hmm. uh, but just to give you a flavor of what kinds of questions we might ask. Yes. 
So just to make sure, does that mean no chief chief? No chief chief. No. Yeah. That's right. No chief chief. No Did I say, uh, say anything to the contrary? Okay. Uh, no, I didn't okay. Okay. Yeah. It, easy. Yes. Uh, it, 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 it may, I've been told that the midterm is not easy. Uh, typically, I try to make it so that the midterm is not easy. Um, uh, most, uh, I'm giving you a fair warning. <laughs> uh, partly because uh, it, it, I, I always think it's easy and then the students tell me it's wrong. So I'm not sure who's right here. Okay, uh, that's a lot of uh, announcements and logistics. Anything else that you want to discuss about these things? not let's uh, switch topics today we're going to start a new unit we're going to start this unit on computational learning theory this part is not about algorithms but about theory this part is not about implementation but about math um this is the, the this is the part of machine learning that's in some sense the core of machine learning that you will not probably encounter in other classes um, before we go into this, just to kind of take stock of where we are and how we got here. Um, for the most part, we've been talking about supervised learning, uh, where we have instances, things that are inputs to models, concepts. These are the functions that, um, that we hope to learn. And hypotheses, these are the functions that we do learn. And the supervised settings basically says, there's some label data. Label data looks like instances paired with labels. This label data goes into a learning algorithm, and the learning algorithm does what it does, and it spits out a hypothesis, the model. This hypothesis can now go out and label new examples. New examples go into this hypothesis and outcome labels. We've looked at at least two specific learning algorithms, perceptron and decision trees, and some variants of these things, but at a, you know, at a, we've looked at two algorithms. Along the way, we've also seen a few different general machine learning ideas. The first one that we saw was the idea that instances can be seen as feature vectors in some high dimensional space. So any instance gets mapped into a vector. Then we looked at uh, this idea of overfitting somewhat informally. We'll look at it more formally in a, in a bit. And we've already uh, kind of spent some time trying to uh, examine the question, what does it mean to learn? And uh, we've examined it from the perspective of this mistake bond model, where we define success as if my learner stops making mistakes over the stream, uh, as the stream of examples keep coming in, I define that as a victory. So that's the definition of whether a concept can or cannot be learned. Any questions about uh, this high level uh, uh, picture. Starting today, possibly going past, quite likely, definitely going past the spring break, we'll be talking about computational learning theory. This is a theory of generalization, um, where first we will look at a definition called probably approximately correct learning. It's just a definition, just like with mistake bound, we saw a definition as something is learnable in the mistake bound model if blah, blah, blah. We'll see the same sort of definition. Something is learnable in the pack, probably approximately correct model if certain properties hold. And based on the definition, uh, we'll be easily able to uh, uh, derive a theorem that I'm uh, that sometimes gets called as the Occam's razor theorem, which says smaller, simpler hypotheses will generalize better. And this term can actually be applied to obtain some positive and negative learnability results, essentially of the form that says this class of concepts should be learnable. They are easy to learn. But this other class of concepts, it's impossible to learn. It's an impossibility sort of a result. Then we'll look at something called agnostic learning. So until we get to agnostic learning, we'll make the assumption that nature gets to choose its function from a set of functions. 
We don't know which function it chooses, but we know the set so that our learning algorithm can explore the same set. In agnostic learning, we'll drop that assumption where we'll say nature gets to choose its function from whatever set of functions it uses. We don't have a clue. We will search a set of functions. How bad can it be? Can we generalize? Then finally, we'll uh, go to this topic of shattering and VC dimension, which is what if you have an infinite number of hypotheses in your hypothesis space? Your search space is infinite. Can we learn? Uh, by the end of this, you'll feel kind of overloaded with theory, uh, but also I hope that you'll get an understanding of uh, a sort of a very clever mechanism to think about what generalization is. Okay, so this is the 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 uh, preview of coming attractions for the next few weeks. Uh, let's go into the first one. Uh, let's think about what does it mean to have a theory of learning or a theory of generalization. Computational learning theory is a, is a field which seeks to ask, are there any laws of nature with respect to machine learning? With respect to, not uh, machine learning, with respect to the, the, the notion of learnability. Learning is such an intuitive sort of human thing that it's hard to think of what does it mean to have laws that say that something can and cannot be learned. So computational learning theory tries to answer that question. In particular, the goal of this theory is to relate the probability of successful learning with the number of training examples that are presented, with uh, the complexity of the hypothesis space, with the accuracy to which we want the target concept to be approximated, and the guarantee that uh, learning uh, will succeed, and also the manner in which examples are presented. Like, will they all be presented as a batch? Will they be presented one at a time, and so on? For the moment, for going ahead, we'll assume that they're all presented as a batch. But we seek the goal of computational learning theory as a field is to relate these different uh, uh, these different ideas to come up with a statement of the form this con this hypothesis space can be uh, you can learn a target concept in uh, from drawn from this concept class uh, efficiently um, with these many number of examples and when I say learn you'll get an, I guarantee an approximate, that you'll get an appro uh, a classifier that is 95% approximate. And this will happen, I guarantee it not 100, uh, you, that you'll succeed not 100 out of 100 times, but 99 times out of 100, you'll get a 95% accurate classifier. If I just confused you, don't worry, we'll kind of unroll, uh, uh, unravel this uh, a little bit. But I want to go back to this uh, example that we encountered uh, before we started online learning. This was the task of learning conjunctions, where uh, nature picks these uh, eight examples. Each example has a label. So there is, this is the set of features, and this is a label. And every example has a label. And the goal is to learn the target function. Since we are kind of looking at it from above, we know what the target function is. The target function is, uh, it's a conjunction of x2, x3, uh, x4, x5, and x100. That means the true function says the label is true or one if all those features are one. If even one of them is zero, the label is zero. So that's the true function. And of course, uh, since this, we are assuming there's no noise here, the the label, uh, this these labels were uh, generated by the true function. The thing that nature uh, picks is the examples that get labeled by uh, the two functions. Okay, so we get access. We, we get access to this uh, these eight examples, and uh, there's a simple algorithm that we saw before that uh, that sometimes get called elimination that uh, can easily and efficiently learn a conjunction. This is a monotone conjunction, and remember, a monotone conjunction is a conjunction where there are no negations. No, none of the features are negated. So elimination proceeds in the following way. First, just delete all the examples where the label is zero. Then start looking at what each feature one at a time. Let's uh, do. Let's go through this uh, for a few features. Feature number one hundred is one among all examples where the label is one. So x one hundred is in the conjunction. 
feature number 99 has the value zero for one of the examples where the label is one. Now, this is a conjunction. This feature has a value zero, and yet the label is one. That means that feature couldn't possibly be in the conjunction. So that means x99 is not in the conjunction. You go through this one at a time, and uh, you know you, this way you you get x5, x4, x3, x2. But notice that x1 happens to be one on all these four examples where the label is one. So the elimination algorithm will learn a conjunction that is x1 and x2 and x3 and x4 and x5 and x100, which is of course not the same as the two functions. Mm -hmm. We've seen this before, but I want to kind of go over this once again. The important point here is we have, this algorithm has found a model, a classifier, a function that's perfectly in a, a agreement with the data, but it's not the same function as the one that uh, that was used by nature. Any questions before? The reason x1 shows up is because whenever the output is 1, x1 is present, and it just so happens that in this particular sample, this holds. Maybe if you choose a different sample, x1 will not show up correlated with label 1. And maybe on that different sample, you will not have x1 in the learned function. So what we have is not the true function, but in a certain sense, we've only learned an approximation of the true function. right? And the question to think about is, is that okay? Very clearly, there are going to be examples where H and F disagree with each other. Mm. Can someone give me an example, okay, an example where these two uh, functions disagree with each other? Where let's say H of X says zero and F of X says one. Just so that X aligns zero and the final results one. No, I, I don't know the final result. I, I just know and, that uh, x2, 3, 4, 5, 100 is 1. Okay, so let's take this example here. So I'm going to write it here x1, 0. Oh, sorry, the other way around, right? Reverse. And what about the other uh, 94 features? Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Let, let's say that all of them are set to 0. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what will the fee, the can someone else tell me what will the prediction of uh, the function h be yeah. zero because x one is zero. What is the prediction of f be one. one? So clearly f and h are uh, a, a, a don't agree with each other, and so the question to think about is we've not learned learning doesn't seem like it succeeded. The elimination algorithm seems to have failed. But is this good enough? Maybe this is all. This is sufficient for us, and maybe this is all we can do. How can we possibly tell using the data that we have that H is not the correct one? Because H also agrees with the data. F also agrees with the data. How could we tell this is not the correct one? There are two sort of uh, directions to think about uh, that we can go from here. One way to think about it is to say that look in this data that we have. We never saw a single instance of x1 being 0 when the true label, when the label is 1. Instead of uh, 8 examples, let's say you have 8 million examples, and let's say this happens. You never saw a single instance where x1 was 0 when the label was 1. Maybe this situation never occurs in data. Or even if it does, it is so rare that I'm willing to live with the error. In this case, for the most part, when you actually deploy the classifier that you learned, it's, it's going to be right. Because x1 is going to be 1 whenever the label is 1. It just so happens that it's accidentally correlated that way. And so, and if it turns out it's not that way, the, the it's such a rare event that it's a, you're going to have a small amount of error. Let's just say we live with the error because that we are going to define success in learning as not high perfectly recovered the concept, but I got within 99% uh, or within 99.9% .9 of the accuracy. This, uh, taking this sort of an intuition uh, uh, to its completion opens up the PAC framework that we'll discuss today. There's another way to think about it. 
Now, this is a mistake driven framework. You only count the number of mistakes. And let's say we, we don't really care about um, that example that is a zero, um, where x1 is zero, because that mistake happens once. And after that mistake happens, the algorithm will fix the class the hypothesis and it will never encounter that mistake. So basically by counting the number of mistakes, we define good as the algorithm uh, does not make more than a polynomial number of mistakes that we saw before. It's a different perspective on defining what success is. In both cases, we are not guaranteed that we will actually recover the true concept because data keeps coming at us and we don't get to control the data that comes. In particular, maybe nature has certain constraints as well. Maybe nature cannot generate adversarial examples. In the mistake bound model, we actually drop the presumption. We say that maybe nature does uh, uh, generate adversarial examples, but even if it does, you're going to just make that one mistake in this case and we'll correct. In the fact model, we'll assume that the data that we have is the true representative of real data. As a result, we will not make, if we didn't make mistakes now, we won't make mistakes in the future. This is going to be the intuition that the back model um, um, uh, sort of generalizes. The thing about the mistake bound model, though, is Anyone see me? Thank you. So the thing about the mistake bound model is that uh, it is a theoretical approach. What that means is you can, like we, like we did with the perceptron algorithm, right? We can determine that uh, the 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 learner will make no more than these many number of mistakes before never making mistakes ever after again. All we know is the number of mistakes. We don't know when those mistakes will happen. And we don't know how many examples you need to encounter before you hit the mistake box. Because all we know is that, there, let's say that the, we have a, let's say that I come with a guarantee to you that uh, this learner will make no more than 100 mistakes on anything that you're gonna learn. And you then you start using that learner and you have encountered a hundred million examples and you have made 99 mistakes. Do you know when the next mistake will happen? No. Maybe not. Maybe you might have to encounter another hundred million million examples before the next mistake happens. So we don't have an answer to the question, how many examples do we need before we have hit that situation where the, uh, the, the learner is done learning? Mm -hmm. This is because the mistake bound model makes no assumptions about the order in which examples will show up. That's both a strength and a weakness. It makes no assumptions as, and yet it can prove mistake bounds. It makes no assumptions so the mistakes can happen anytime. Okay, so that, that, that uh, to kind of go around that uh, problem, PAC learning specifically tries to answer this question. How many examples do you need for guaranteed learning? It's a model for batch learning. Batch learning is the st most dominant kind of uh, uh, way in which we deploy machine learning today, where we have some training set, we train a model on the training set, and then we deploy a model, and it encounters examples in the wild and makes predictions. Uh, decision tree, the ID3 algorithm was a batch learner. You had a fixed training set, and you can iterate on that, you can do whatever, set, extract whatever statistics you want from that data to get the uh, to build your classifier, and then on the test example, you just have make predictions. In contrast, the online perceptron does not have a training and a test phase that is separate. Pack learning tries to answer the question: How well will your learning algorithm do on future examples after it was trained on this fixed uh, training set with these many examples? And in fact, it tries to specifically answer the question of. How big should your uh, training set be to get some guarantee that you'll, your final classifier will have certain, um, uh, so uh, no more than a certain error? And also, uh, can we guarantee that learning will succeed? What if I say that you need 500 examples to learn and somehow 
you just got unlucky with the choice of your 500 examples and they were all so noisy that you could not actually succeed. It can happen. So the, can we guarantee that learning will succeed or what's the probability that we can assign to the success of learning that we'll find a good classifier? Fact learning tries to kind of tie in all these things together into one theoretical framework. All of this is just a sort of a preamble for setting up the notation and uh, diving into some math. So we have an instance space. As always, we have an instance space. We'll call that X. This is a set of all possible examples, even examples that have not yet been created. There's a concept space, which is for now the set of all possible target functions. This is uh, at least for the initial part of this discussion. We'll assume that both nature and the learner chooses functions from this set. I'll use the letter capital C to denote the concept space. Uh, it's a, there is one special function F inside this concept space that nature has chosen to label examples. And uh, these could be well-defined uh, set of, uh, uh, you know, named sets of functions like all conjunctions in n dimensions or all linear classifiers in n dimensions or all neural networks of a certain shape. The hypothesis space uh, is actually slightly different from the concept space. It can be different, but for now it's going to be the same. It's that it's a set of uh, uh, functions that the learner explores. The concept space is not a set that we usually have access to outside of this sort of classroom setting. We don't know what function nature uses to decide the stock price of Apple tomorrow. We don't know what function nature uses to decide whether a certain image is a cat or not. I mean, when I say what function, what mathematical function? Um, the hypothesis space is all we can control, and that's the set that our learner will explore. For the initial parts of this discussion, I'll assume that capital H and capital C are the same set. And then we'll drop that assumption when uh, we come to agnostic learning. Now, we are in the supervised setting, so we're going to have access to a set of training examples. The training, each, the training example, um, formally looks like this cross product of a set S, which is a finite subset of X with minus one, one. This is just a complicated way of saying the your training set consists of pairs. Each element of the pair is an example and a label. And the label is because it is F applied to that example, F of X1 can either be minus one or one because we are in the world of binary classification. And so we have a fixed, a finite set of uh, uh, examples that we are training on. I notice here that I'm using n for the size here and n for features. Um, I should fix that. The, the size of the number of training examples is uh, has nothing to do with the number of features yet. What do we want out of any learning algorithm? What we would like is that the learning algorithm discovers a hypothesis little h, which is inside capital H, such that h of x and f of x agree. Is that okay? Is that a reasonable requirement? f of x is the true function. h of x is what the learner uh, proposes, the hypothesis that the learner proposes. And we would like these two functions to be the same on, on some x, right? Yeah. Question for you. Do we want this to be... Uh, the case for all x in the training set S, or do we want this to be the case for all x in the instance space capital X? How many people think that our goal is that learning should produce a hypothesis that agrees with the true function on the training set? Half a hand. How many people think it should be okay? Two half hands, so I'll count it as one. Um, how many people think that the goal of learning is to produce a hypothesis that agrees with the true function on the entirety of the instant space? More than one hand. So, and why? Why? Yes. There's not be able to apply to stuff. That's right. We don't really care about the training data. If you ask me what's the label of this training example, 
I don't need to go through this whole process of learning and to produce the label. I can just look up the label. I have access to the training data. I have access to the two label. Might as well just look it up. What we want is uh, to evaluate the hypothesis on future examples. On, but then there's a sort of a uh, subtlety here. Not all examples in the instance space are equally likely to show up. Some instances are probably going to show up a lot more than some other instances. So we want our learner to succeed on examples that are drawn from the same distribution that constructed the training set. Now, this is a somewhat subtle concept, and I want to spend, I want to dwell on this a little bit. So let me give you uh, an example. So let's say, that, let's assume that we have this two-dimensional instance space. So we have two features called this X1 and this is X2. So each point here is a single instance. Now, in, in the discussion that we've had in the class so far, oh, there's a, yes. If uh, there's a question, if S is a subset of X, are there no repeated data points? Uh, for now, let's pretend that there are no repeated data points. Everything that we do, it turns out that that's not going to matter. So let's consider, uh, uh, so, so for, I'm saying, for now, no, not for now, so far, we have assumed that uh, our go the goal of learning is to get the right label on any instance from the instance space. No matter which, which point is drawn, we want f of x equals h of x. That seems like a reasonable goal. But I'm going to argue that that's, actually a very, very difficult goal to reach because you know we only have a finite training set. Think of that uh, elimination algorithm that we saw. That feature X1, how could we possibly tell that the feature X1 was not present in the conjunction when the data that we have provided evidence, provided no evidence to the contrary? So how could you possibly tell the, that uh, that one function F was the true function? To get around this problem, we're going to note that not every point in the instance space is equally likely. Think about it this way. Imagine that my feature representation for an email is just a big list uh, that uh, with one dimension for every word, and we just count how many times does each word show up, right? So it's like a, a big vector of the size whose dimensionality is just the vocabulary of the English language, and the email uh, has been tokenized into words, and you count how many times the word the show up, how many times does the word cat show up, three show up. So, you know, it's a big vector. If I randomly pick a vector in this high dimensional space, in this, let's say that there are 300,000 words in our dictionary. If I randomly pick a point in the 300,000 dimensional space, will that correspond to an email? Imagine that one point in that email instance space is um, the word the shows up a million times. The word a uh, shows up a million times and no other word shows up. Can you think of some email that's composed with just a million the's and a million us? Of course not. So, however, that corresponds up to one point in this feature space. So not every point in the feature space is a valid instance. Not every instance even is uh, 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 is equally likely as uh, not all instances are equally likely. Some types of email are more likely, right? So similarly, some kinds of names are more common if you are classifying names. So some instances are more uh, likely to occur in nature than other instances. And rather than saying that I want a classifier that can do perfectly across the instance space, we could ask, I want a classifier that does well on all the instances that are common, that does as well as possible on that, whose error is somehow weighted by the frequency or the commonality of an instance. So formally, that means that there's some probability that any point in the instance space is an instance, can actually occur in nature. So you can think of it as this sort of a distribution that's overlaid this two-dimensional instance space. Or if you don't like a weird uh, projection of this thing, let's use contour plots. Mm. So uh, you're familiar with contour plots, right? 
we live in Utah. We can't go hiking without counter plot. Mm. Um, these circles get these regions are more probable than these regions, for example. So what we have here is some instances are more likely to occur in nature than some other instances. And our training set comes from this instance phase. It's a finite subsample from this instance phase, right? It's sampled not uniformly at random from this instance phase, but according to this probability. Mm -hmm. The instances that can occur more common, commonly in nature are more likely to show up in your training set. Mm -hmm. Instances that are unlikely to show up in nature, like I think these regions have zero probability, so you will never see an instance of that type in your training data. You will never see an instance of that type in your test data. These regions have very high probability, so you'll see a, you see a lot more. These regions have lower probability, so you see fewer examples. Of that. So the assumption that we are making is that there is some probability distribution that exists over the instance space, and every instance in the training data, every instance that we encounter in any data set, is sampled IID from this distribution. What does IID mean? Independent and identically distributed. Independent means the choice of this instance does not affect the choice of that instance. It's sampled. These sampling, the sampling is done independent. Identically distributed means they all come from the same distribution. And here's the kicker. We may not even know what this distribution is. If I ask you, what is the probability distribution that dictates whether uh, the, the distribution of cats in nature? I'm not even sure that's a well-formed question. Maybe there's a... Uh, uh, or what's the probability distribution that governs natural images, you know, a collection of pixels being an image versus just noise? You can think that some collections of pixels are more like images than some others, right? So there is some distribution, but we don't have access to that. And we are going to assume that we are, we are not going to assume that we have access to it. In fact, we're going to make the assumption that we have, there exists a distribution that generates instances in nature, and that distribution is fixed and possibly unknown. But the important point is it's fixed. Any questions about this? This is going to be like a key underlying assumption that uh, pack learning makes in order to kind of uh, build up the theory. And I also know that uh, the first time some people encounter this idea of Distribution over instance spaces, it makes them slightly uncomfortable. Um, or distributions over high dimensional vector spaces. And the best way to get comfortable with it is keep staring at it and ask questions. We're just laying the groundwork for pack learning. Yes. So we don't. We just assume that we have some feature space. Mm -hmm. We are making. A, we are. We are kind of. Uh, we the that assumption from before get carried on. We're not assuming before. We're just saying in this feature space, there's a certain distribution over the examples, and na nature picks prefers certain assignments to these features over certain other assignments. So then. Uh, build up this intuition for pack learning. The thing is, why why did I go through this whole process of describing this fixed distribution of numbers? It turns out it gives us it opens up some doors. The uh, keeping the distribution of instances fixed allows us to at least hope that anything that trained on a training set, which is a sample from the distribution will do well on future examples, which is also a sample from that distribution. Because future examples are also picked from that distribution. Nature does not change the distribution because the distribution over instances is fixed. And perhaps more uh, uh, importantly, or at least perhaps uh, equally importantly, this assumption of a fixed and perhaps unknown distribution allows us to formally define the notion of error of a classifier. Let's look at that definition. Uh, but before we look at the definition, uh, 
so, sometimes I like to think of this idea that this distribution over instances is fixed you, as the assumption that the future will be like the past. In the past, we collected a whole bunch of training data uh, from a certain distribution D, and we built a classifier. This classifier is going to be evaluated in the future. If nature decides to switch up and completely change the distribution of examples, then there is no hope that uh, what you learned on data collector on the past is going to actually work in the future. For example, in the past, in that uh, toy example that I had, the feature X1 was always present whenever um, the possible, whenever an example is possible. And that's what you train your model on. And the hope is in the future, this feature will also be present in future possible examples. And if nature decides that during training, I'm going to collect a whole bunch of examples where X1 is present on uh, with a positive example, but at evaluation time, I'm going to collect all examples where X1 is absent, where the label is positive. That means your classifier that you learn is going to make mistakes on every future example because nature switched up the distribution. While training, it picked examples that had a certain property. At test time, it said that property no longer holds. Question. No, it doesn't. No, uh, so that's a good, that's an interesting question. Um, by distribution, the question is: Do I mean like a named distribution, like Poisson or Gaussian or anything? No, I'm assuming that we have a fixed, but possibly unknown distribution. We don't even, we are not even going to need to characterize the distribution. All we need to know about that distribution is that it does not change. And that every example is drawn IID from that distribution. These are the only two things we need. We will need going ahead. We don't need to know what the distribution of examples. We don't, like I said, you know, given a collection of pixels, what's the distribution over cat images? I don't know. It's a non-trivial question, and we are not going to have to answer that. How and I, how? We I didn't well. We represented by the letter D. Um, <laughs> we're just giving it. A, we're just giving it a name, um, and we don't need to identify it. As we will see, the only property of the distribution that actually used in proving anything that we prove is. The only two properties are that examples are drawn IID from it and that it is fixed. In fact, this is a good uh, segue into the second point there, which is the notion of error, because that's what we are trying to minimize uh, in the future. The error of a hypothesis, given a distribution over example, the error of the hypothesis is defined to be the probability that the predicted label on, uh, on an example is different from the true label on that example for an example that is sampled from that distribution. Okay, this is basically saying, in or in, it turns out this is equivalent to an expectation also. But it's saying that what's the probability that if a random example gets chosen from that distribution, the fixed but unknown distribution that uh, we have assumed. What's the probability that your classifier that you've learned disagrees from nature, disagrees from the one that nature has? This is just a formal definition of the error. And just as a cartoon example, let's go back to the two-dimensional instance space that we had. These are the instances. And let's pretend that uh, our classifier, the true model, the true target concept, labels all points inside this circle as positive and everything outside as negative. And let's say that uh, we've got a learning algorithm that learns a different hypothesis. It learns this other circle where the uh, you know the the it says that the points inside that circle are positive and outside are negative. The error of this classifier is basically the points where all the points where this disagrees. But it's not the points where it disagree, but it's the probability that you will get points from here according to that distribution that. Uh, is not known to us. It's just a formal definition of error that we will have to kind of, uh, we will eventually approximate using uh, samples that we are going to give the name, the test set. The test set is just a sample from a set of samples from this distribution. At 
दिस पॉइंट समबडी शुड हैव क्वेश्चन Yes. So the error probability that the two are not the same. The error is the cumulative probability over those two. Oh yeah, the, sorry. The error is the probability that the uh, is that what you mean? The H and F are yes, that's right. That's proceed to the Yes. For any randomly sampled X. From that distribution. What happens if we increase the number of features and go beyond even the number of our data points? This regularly happens. Oh wow, there are many questions on Zoom. Good. So the first one is what happens if the number of features is much more than the number of data points? This happens all the time, and uh, we just live with it. And uh, typically, one thing that happens. happens is if the number of features increases as we will see uh, in a multiple in a few different uh, instances any learning algorithm runs the risk high, runs a higher risk of overfitting um because if you have enough number of features basically you can use those features to memorize any training data um and the theory will review, will kind of that comes out that will come out of the theory in fact we've already seen an uh, instance of that where the difficulty of learning uh, correlates with the number of features with pers with the uh, uh, perceptron the number mistake bound is r square over gamma square and if you kind of convert that into boolean functions it turns out that that corresponds to roughly the order of number of features that you have as the number of feature increases number of mistakes will increase another question is can you calculate the error to be a single number it's a probability can can i say that the error is 10% turns out that this definition of error while it is well defined it's also a theoretical concept because we can't actually calculate this probability because we do not know the distribution the distribution is fixed but unknown so we can't actually calculate the error using this definition the only thing we can do to calculate the error is to approximate it by using samples from that distribution in other words we have a test set and we measure the error on the test examples um the error is a symmetric set difference of h and f over the union of h and f well it's actually not quite the symmetric difference uh, so the question is is the error this region and this region it's not quite that it's actually the total probability mass that the instance space assigns to those regions what is the probability that you will end up with an instance from there that's basically the error this notion of error of a hypothesis is sometimes called the generalization error or the true error it's the true error because it's the error that the the uh, your hypothesis can make in the future it's something that we can't really measure because we don't have access to the distribution the only thing we can actually measure is called the empirical error the empirical error is given a collection of examples for example the training set could also be the test set given a collection of examples s it is the empirical error is simply the fraction of examples where the true function f and your learned function the hypothesis h disagree the fraction of examples in that set where the two functions disagree is called the empirical error on this particular set so i'm calling it error s these two errors allow us to define overfitting we've already encountered overfitting before but we can define overfitting once again uh in in terms of the generalization error which is simply the probability of x which is drawn from d of f of x not equal to h of x and the empirical error which is basically i'm going to just write it this is let's call this error d and then the error s is simply 1 over the size of s which is the number of examples sum over um i'm just putting a 1 here that says f of x is not equal to h of x so this thing here is it counts the number of examples where h of x and f of x 
disagree. So imagine that we have a training set, S. And using that training set, we ended up finding a particular hypothesis H that has very low training error, very low empirical error. And then we take that hypothesis and somehow we are able to imagine, uh, again, because the generalization error is a conceptual object, imagine that we, are, we have access to this new error on top. And we find that the generalization error for the, that hypothesis is very, very high. Uh, what that means is that this particular hypothesis fooled the learning algorithm into thinking that it was good. It was the true function because it got a low error on the training set, when in fact that hypothesis is actually bad. What do I mean by bad? It has a poor generalization error. Mm -hmm. Question. So I might not be thinking of this the right way, but we don't know the, the distribution, but can we fit the distribution to the examples that we do have? You could, but uh, rather than that, you can just estimate it. If you know that your two examples are IIV from the training sets, from the true distribution, then simply computing this uh, uh, fraction of examples, this is an approximation of that. So you don't even need to know the distribution. Right? Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Other questions? Yes. In this process, um, we don't know the distribution, but we're trying to figure out what the distribution is. We are not, we, no, 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 no. Uh, uh, that's, that's a good question. Are we trying to figure out what the distribution is? Or are we trying to figure out what the true function is? What we are trying to figure out is, despite not knowing the distribution, can we find a good hypothesis? Because we don't know the distribution. The goal of batch learning is basically to invent learning algorithms that avoid overfitting. And overfitting is where a certain hypothesis pulls the learner into thinking it's good by being really good on the training data and actually generalizes poorly. Yes, there's a question. The, the empirical error actually is a training error. Empirical error, if it is applied to the training set, it's a training error. If it's applied to the test set, it's a test error. It's just a fraction of examples in a set that is misclassified. Here I say S is the training set because I want to define the concept of overfit. If S becomes the test set, then S becomes, then it's a generalization. It's a, it's a approximation of the true error. So very briefly, I want to go over this. Uh, we've encountered online learning and back learning, and I want to just compare and contrast these two protocols for learning. In online learning, we make no assumption about how examples are distributed. We, we, this notion of distribution of examples does not exist. In fact, in online learning, we make a worst case assumption. There is, nature is adversarial and can order the examples, choose examples that are the worst ones to fool this learner. In batch learning, we make an assumption that examples are drawn from a fixed and perhaps unknown distribution over the instance space. In online learning, learning operates in uh, uh, as a sequence of uh, rounds. At each uh, round, the learner encounters one example. The version of online learning that we saw was mistake-driven learning. So the learner encounters one example. It's allowed to make a prediction. And if it is the prediction is a mistake, then it loses a point and it gets a chance to update its hypothesis. In batch learning, the learner uses a training set which is drawn IID from the training from that distribution and it can do whatever it wants with that data to produce a hypothesis. In online learning, the goal, the game here, is to put a bound on the number of mistakes that the learner can eventually make over time, over up to infinity. In uh, batch learning, the goal is to find a hypothesis that has a low probability of making error on future examples that are also drawn from the same distribution data. Yes. So is there like a crossover between these in any way? I guess like the example I'm thinking of is like if we have electric vehicles or uh, like self-driving vehicles mm -hmm. and we deploy them now and then they get a bunch of experience and all this new data. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't we want to use that? Yeah, in fact, that's actually the model that's usually used in practice. 
Um, I, I'll give you a concrete example. Let's take Chat GPT. The first version that was released in November 2022, I think, is not the one that's on the website right now because as we use it, the company harvests the data and keeps improving it. Um, and that's true for any sort of a um, uh, system that does it. Uh, Google search, for example, is the company is called Google. The product is called Google and the interface is basically one search bar where you type things. But the code that executes behind it and the models that execute behind it are not the same as uh, the one that uh, came about in 1998. Why? Because Google harvests the data and keeps improving. So if there is a certain sort of a, uh, there is, is a sort of an online issue flavor over a much larger time horizon. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So, other questions? Yes. Um, we are talking about instances where there is a distribution. Mm -hmm. um, what does it mean to have an instance space without a distribution? What does is there any instance space where there is no distribution? Is it an unlearnable uh, problem? I don't know what that means, where there's an instance space. I mean, uh, uh, okay, next question. So there, uh, when we are targeting a problem, there has to be a distribution in the instance case. There, whether it's known or unknown. Yes, nature generates data in a certain sort of a systematic way. Do you have a question? Yeah, I mean, Actually, the distribution could change, yeah? Yes, <laughs> the distribution could change. In fact, in nature, of course it does change. The kind of things that, imagine that we are classifying news articles uh, into topics like entertainment and politics and sports. The kinds of things, words that were used in, say, 1965 to describe these topics are not the same as the words that are used to describe the same topics. Of course, that the distribution of instances have changed. This leads. This is called a distribution shift or domain shift, and it's a huge problem. Uh, if we can only guarantee that learning will succeed when the distribution does not change, and nature keeps changing its distribution, how do we adapt our models? And it's like a big sort of a uh, uh, open question that there are different sort of solutions for, but it's an important question. Yes. So you can. So this was the same question that came up before. Can we learn the distribution itself? Of course you can. In the context of this lecture, we are not. But uh, there are learning paradigms where we seek to learn the distribution of the data. Uh, that in very loosely speaking, if we anytime we build a model called a generative model. What they are doing is actually learning the distribution of a data uh, of the instances. And there, there is a lot of literature on that. We'll talk about the difference between these two perspectives of learning much later uh, in the semester.